Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Michael Redman, professional Go player. Uh, how's the sound? Uh, good morning, Rick. So, does everyone hear me? Oh, very good. Okay, so I'll start the game. Um, I sort of showed this this position because it sort of indicates what's going to happen in the first fight of the game. Very good, yes. So I'll go back to the beginning of the game here. And I had black in this game. This is um, the qualifying tournament for the Duse Cup, which is... Uh, a TV tournament. So it's a, it, the main tournament is going to be, I think it's 30 seconds per move or something like that. Um, so it's going to be a, what they call lightning goal. It's going to be a quick tournament. But um, the qualifying tournament actually gives us one hour a piece. So we have one hour a piece and then it's um, second reading after that for each move. So we do have some time, but you can see my opponent is playing a slightly unusual opening here. I have the black stones and um, maybe um, to try to drag me into a variation that I'm um, not quite prepared for, which is sort of what happened. So white played here and this is actually um, supposed to be good for black, the position in the upper right corner here where white has played the two, uh, two stones there and then did not connect. So if you ask an AI, a gold playing computer, it will probably tell you at any point that white is supposed to connect here. And black's maybe going to answer something on the right here. And then white will probably play an extension on the, on the upper line anyway. I, I mean on the upper side. Um, Yusei Cup. That's Tassia Singh asking of the Yusei Cup, is there anywhere to watch it live? No, you cannot watch it live and next unless you're someone who has to do with the filming of it so it's um yeah so it's a pay tv station and you have to be a member of that station to, to actually see it actually if you went to the nihon kin and ichigaya i think they show some of the games sometimes on the first floor so if you are at the nihon kin the go association in ichigaya you have to be living in japan i suppose then sometimes they broadcast the what's going on the stat the studio is um on the underground floor of the building and so sometimes they broadcast the game that's going on downstairs if you're lucky um so back to the game this this would be a, a variation that would be given a good score by the computer as relatively but my opponent has a plan here Oh yes, Satya Singh. Of course, if you subscribe to the broadcasting uh, station, it's um, uh, KATV, I think. Um, let's see, I don't really remember. It's it's um, Igo Shogi Channel. So it um, it's a channel that also does um, Japanese chess shogi. And if you're signed up to it, then you um, you can get it on satellite some, or you can get it um, sometimes. You can get it on a local um, local network. In Japan, that is. Yes. So, uh, back to the game. When I cut here, so according to computer programs, this is probably supposed to be good for, for black. Thank you, Fuyang. Uh, explaining the uh, setup of the tournament. Actually, they've increased the number of sections it has. And it's probably more like 10 sections now. So um, the players in the section that I'm going, after I won this game, I'm going to be in the televised games. And in those games, the players are arranged into several groups. And I think it's about 10. Uh, I think it's about 10 groups um, that the players are arranged in according to their rank. So being a nine dime, I, I'm going to be pretty close to the end of the line. And the lowest ranks players play each other in a um, 
and a sequence of games where the winner goes on to the second round and there's one player waiting for that person and the winner of the, that player and the winner from the first round um, go on to the third round. So it's one person is eliminated in each round. And they go up the ladder. Um, I think they called it a paramath or something like that. They go up the ladder up to the top players. And so two of the players um, in each section get into the final tournament. And one of the players, the player who had the most wins in a row, and in my case, I'm pretty close to the end, so I have to win all the way to the end of the tournament. So it's actually, I'll be tough, playing a lot of tough players, and I have to win every game. So it's difficult for nine dunks to win that tournament. But I did win this, yeah, sort of, um, sort of a spoiler, but I did win this game, yes. So I played the Kakari here, and White is playing... Um, an extension here and this sort of makes sense if we look at the upper right corner the joseki is to pull back here and if black plays here white can play an extension so this would be one way to play it locally in this board position i would probably just ignore white playing there and start with this and i might even play something like this on the side Um, I don't completely understand what Don Slayer is saying, but, um, wouldn't it be easier to use the same opening to totally one for black and white? Oh yes. Okay. For tournaments like this. So, so yeah, that's an idea of, um, having a fixed, uh, opening that you play every time, uh, when the game has relatively short time limits, short time control. Um, and I was sort of doing that, but um, when you have an opponent, it don't, doesn't always go according to plan. So when my opponent played this Kakari, approach move against my corner immediately, this is already um, going to be a bit unusual, whatever I do. So I, I sort of have a plan here, but it's not something that I have a lot of experience with, this opening. Okay, so back to the game. In the game, White played this pincer. I think I agree with this move. And I pressed here. So this is a point where if white answers on the left, it's probably not going to be very good for white. Um, I actually did, um, I'm starting to do videos on this kind of position where black is pressed at the 5-4 point. Um, they'll be coming out fairly soon. So in this case, black gets to pincer here. And even if white um, extends here, all of white's stones are going to be weak. So white's going to be on, in trouble on both sides. So I think I like this one for black. And so white pushes through. I, I sort of agreed with this. And this is one of the most difficult modern Josegis. For instance, if you use an AI to learn how to play, um, for the most part, it's going to give you relatively simple Josegis. Like an example of that would be in this upper left corner here, it would be sort of suggesting moves like this or like this, which allow black to play an extension on the side and opening tends to be relatively um, peaceful. But when white pincers here, uh, the computer program will say that it's good for black when black presses. But then when white pushes through and cuts here, there's a huge amount of um, variations. I don't really recommend this for most players on either side because it's going to be very, very complicated. But I think my opponent... Um, why not kick? That's Fuyan Bian. Are we talking about Black's move? Um, maybe we're talking about kicking here. Or maybe kicking for white. I'm not sure what the question is. Kicking for white is an option, but in this case it's probably not so good when Black just switches to the, to the, um, to the left side. I hope that was a good answer. Um, not sure exactly which kick was being talked about. The white move. Okay, good. Okay, so when white um, pushes through and cuts here, white's trying to use that pincer um, as a, an attack against the black stone. Right. White wants to make it a fight. Basically, white has some potential, um, a forcing move here, which is really vulgar, but in some cases, white's going to be using forcing moves in this vicinity. 
and a local advantage in the upper left corner. So white's going to make a fight of it. Kicking at the first place. Okay, now I understand the question. So Fuyang was talking about this move, where white kicks at the first place. And and yes, the answer that the Don Slayer was getting is correct. And that it's probably a bad idea in this game to give black the upper side. When black already has some structure in the upper right corner, it's going to be a good side territory spreading out into the center. So those two stones here, um, white's going to try to do something a bit more active to make these stones worthwhile, after all. And it, it involves more fighting than, than this kind of thing. So. It was his plan, so I'm just getting guessing to a certain extent. So I press and push through. And I have researched this, so I, I, I thought I knew what I was doing. Yes. So black pulls out. And, okay, so here from here on, there's going to be a lot of variations. I'm going to try to keep it relatively simple. So at this point, uh, the game move was that white pushed here. And white's other option would be to play here. And from hundreds of years ago, uh, it was said that this is bad for white because black can play here and will be threatening to poke. If white plays in the corner, then black's threatening to poke out here. And this is going to be bad for white. Um, recently, we see white playing moves like this. And in most cases, and maybe black, black's going to capture white in the corner with a move like this. Um, sometimes you see black playing here. You probably have seen this. If you're watching professional games, you've probably seen it happen. Um, I'll just leave it there. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, sometimes black actually sacrifice. I probably shouldn't leave it here. Let, let's just give you an example variation where black is going to squeeze. And when it looks like this, uh, in this game, black might play on this side. Black does have a peep here to look at. And so it's okay for black. This is a variation that's considered pretty much even, but um, black can look forward to a, another peep from outside to make use of those two stumps. So there's some good stuff waiting for black. Oh yes, Rick Rubenstein asked a question about the, the pulling back here. Um, that's this variation where black covers on the second line. Um, trying to explain that will be a bit too complicated, and um, so I'll just say I'm not 100% sure, but I have not seen this very much in the case of this two-space pincer. So it, it sort of depends on where this pincer stone is, like if it's on the fourth line at this point, then blocking on the third line like this is quite pop popular, and it's something that was first... We didn't really play it very much before AlphaGo, and AlphaGo did play it in one of the master games, one of the 60 games it played against humans on the internet. Um, and so it, it did play it, and that was with the high pincer at H16 that I put a, a triangle on. I don't see this move very much with the low pincer. With the low pincer, it's almost 100% this move, and I think this move is better. But um, I'd have a very difficult time explaining. I'm going to have a hard enough time just explaining the basic variations of this jail here. So um, if white plays here, the black's plan will be to play here. And black will either be able to jump out or get some kind of a trade or maybe even capture white in the corner. So uh, there was a white playing here and black sometimes playing here, but um, sometimes playing here, I think. And, um, this is this variation that I showed like this, this is something that actually happens where, where black sacrifices two stones. And this is okay for black. So that's one thing I had prepared, actually. I would have been okay in that variation. But white extended, uh, sorry, white ex pushed here. So this is white's strongest local move. Right, right, exactly. The Don Slayer has it right. White pushed a few times. And... There's a question. This is the branching point of this Joseki. When white has pushed on the fifth line, uh, white has a choice here of pushing more, protecting the corner, or immediately going after the two black stones. So first of all, let's look at the pushing move. If white pushes here, black can slide into the corner. 
and um, in the main line, in what I would call the main line variation, black's going to capture those two stones. So white will continue with this, and white will probably continue on the outside, uh, something like this, and black will get that uh, corner territory. So this is what I would call the main line. Usually this corner territory for black, it's pretty big. That was a corner that started out being white's corner. And so it's pretty big. Complications can happen when white tries something different. Like, for instance, if white at some point plays an attachment here, it would be a different thing. Um, but I, I'd say that the, the white's best bet at this point is probably to play this, this trade here. Um, I'm not going to go into the details there. It would last forever and it would be confusing. So I won't do it. So another move that is actually fairly prop popular is for white to go after black's two stones immediately. And these two stones will not die unconditionally. So for black, the idea is that black is getting a lot of stones on the fourth line here, so that's a profit for black. And black has the option of sacrificing those two stones when it's going to be a co or something. So it's I'm sort of ambiguous about exactly what it's going to turn into. But I can show you a di diagram. So it's like this. Black does get this curling around move. It's a huge move towards the left side. And black's going to slide here. And it's going to be something like a co. So black has to play here. White's going to push through. Black has a choice of pulling back or covering. Um, actually, quite often black will um, pull back. But this is the variation that I got from Katago in this particular board position. Where black has played the double hane there on the first line, locally black is thinking of obviously playing here, which is going to make a ko out of it. But black doesn't have any ko threats at this time, and so Katago actually just played the one hane on the first line, and then played away, allowing white to capture it, and then continued with this variation, which is sort of neat. Um, to be frank, I don't really get the meaning of that hane on the first line. I don't see why it's necessary. And it seems to be a slight loss for black, but um, this is supposed to be okay for black anyway. So this is what Katago thinks is good for black. And I would have been uh, happy to play that same variation, maybe without the Hane on the first line. I, I would have probably played here immediately, allowed white to capture, and played the same way. Um, but the basic fact is that if black does play h19 at some point, black is going to have um, have a coded. So a code to live or to make a um, semi. -an. I don't want to use that code thread. So that that was actually a good point uh, by Satya Singh. Singh, I suppose. Um, Black has a code thread at f15 or f14. Black has code threads there, which are locally very bad exchanges when white answers them. So um, to go back to that code variation. It's not really going to be a direct call. Um, white takes the call. When black plays locally bad moves like this or like this. Um, and let's just have white play. Black actually needs one more move to make a call out of it. Connecting the code doesn't do anything. It, this is actually is a sui suicide move. Black's going to lose the semi. So black actually needs um, more code threats. Uh, maybe cutting here. Uh, actually, maybe black could play here. Um, by the time black wins the call, it's going to be pretty painful. So, for instance, in a position like this, uh, conceivably black could win the call. Actually, white has a local call threat here. White has a call threat here. Maybe black's not even going to win the call. Um, so it would be a black actually needs a large number of call threats and doesn't actually want to play call threats that lose points. So that would be my answer to that question. And it's probably more profitable for black just to allow white to play, to spend one more move to finish that group off. Yes. Instead of playing, white, black would like to play co that are not painful at all. So that, that would be my goal in this case. Oops, so I, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit there. So here we are with the main variation here. So that, that was, uh, first of all, pushing here. Uh, black captures the corner. Probably. that That's sort of an if. It, it depends on how white reacts here, but that's what I would call the main line. When white plays here, 
my plan would be to sacrifice... Oh, sorry, that's not the main line. When white plays here, my plan would be to sacrifice those three stones with a potential ko, and I would be happy with this variation too. So instead, white played this one. So this is the move that I had not researched very well. And I got into a lot of trouble. So actually, to show you the correct variation here to start with, I should have played here. And I was sort of uh, trying to preserve my time since we only had one hour to play the whole game. So I was playing relatively quickly, even though it was a tight... I was figuring I would be, in this kind of game, there would be plenty of calculation to do later in the game also. So I was trying to play relatively quickly. And I didn't really read this one out. So if black plays this here, we have to think about white surrounding it from outside. And I quickly read out this variation which is going to be a one-move victory for white. Um, so, for instance, something like this. And black has no way to fill a liberty. So I'm going to lose this semi by one move, and this would be bad for me. But I didn't consider this move deeply. So actually, black can play here. And if white answers from the corner, this is going to be a kind of a ladder like thing so black can just keep on filling liberties and um throughout this white's only going to have two liberties so white's going to lose the race to capture in this case so black wins so white cannot play from the corner and we'll probably play here but this is this is a cope so it's not really clear white doesn't have the option of connecting here if white connects, black will fill a liberty, and it's going to be like this. Actually, uh, this is sort of an interesting variation, where white gets an eye there, and black's going to get an eye too. I'll probably uh, play this exchange. And so it's going to be a seki there. But this was a corner that started off being white's, white's corner, so a seki is going to be a good variation. That's going to be good for black. So that was good for me. So an actual play it's going to be this call. Why it's not going to connect and it's going to be it's going to be a bit messy but it's I guess it's okay for black. It looks okay to me now. Yes. So back to okay, let's see just try not to lose myself in the variations. So this is the game move and I failed to play this exchange. So if I played here, white's going to answer in the corner. And then I get to move out. So I could move out this way. Actually, I could even move out this way. Now that I have some extra liberties for that black group on the left, I can move out this way. And if white extends, um, I can pull on the second one. So it looks like I'm okay with this variation. So I jumped out. Now when I jump out here, um, this is a bit slower than the previous variation, and I'm going to get into trouble. White pushed here. And basically, white's going to push on the fourth line and is looking at uh, potential of doing stuff like this to surround me when I don't have very many liberties to on the upper side. Yeah, it's, it's really bad when a professional makes a Joe taking mistake. Um, so I chose this point to try to force this move. So this is the game sequence. And if white answers here, and then I get to play this move. Or you could, I could even play here. And I, I'm going to be okay on the upper side in this case. So white did not answer and covered here. Okay, so here I, I thought I found a really good move. Um, I'm completely outside of my preparation at this point, but I thought I saw a good move. And it turns out I probably should have just simply played down here, and something like this might happen. Uh, both the black group and the white group are not alive yet, so black has the attachment at B18. If white covers at B10, the black group is dead also. So it's it's going to be some kind of weird semi, which is going to be either a ko or... Uh, let's just show you part of it. <laughs> so it could be a semi sort of like this. Uh, where um, both groups are dead. 
locally. And it's going to be a co or something maybe. And it's going to be really complicated. Or, um, or if white answers, actually white's not going to do this, but th this would be relatively easy for black where black is going to be alive there. So it's going to be easy for black. In the game, okay, I played this move. So I thought I found a really nice move here, Tesuji. Hitting white um, at the key point. Right. Well, yeah, it sort of depends, but you might be right on the non-slayer. Okay, game Gamera uh, is getting anxiety from this sequence. I, I was a bit anxious too. Yeah. So I, black, white pushes through, black crawls once more and jumps. So this is the squeeze that I had ready. And I thought I was, I knew what I was doing still. So yeah, I, I didn't really. <laughs> so white pushes through and covers. And I get the play of the Atari. And once underneath, you can see I'm sort of heading to, to getting a living shape here. So it's not, it's not going to be a complete collapse. But if I live immediately like this, white also will be able to live with this move. So it will be an easy life for white also. And something like this might continue. White would um, sacrifice one stone and get a position on the upper side. White has the forcing move on the second line. White might play that at some point, uh, the forcing move here, which I would answer here. Um, and this is okay for white. This seems white's pushing black a little bit um, white does have close to 10 points in the corner, 9 points there. And so this would be okay for white, I think. I tried for something a little bit extra. Actually, I played what I think was a really interesting move. So when white extended here, I took this timing to play here. And with this move, I'm going to stop white from getting a living shape. So obviously, I, I thought I was doing well. Um... So if I play here, white can live by capturing the two stones. When I play here, if white answers here, I'm going to play an Atari here and extend. And although these black stones are all like lined up on the first line, there's no way for white to fill any liberties there. So white would have to play from the outside here. And I would be able to just capture these white stones. It would be very quick. So that would be easy for black. Therefore, white has to capture the two stones. Uh, in the game, white captured them with the throw in here. So I play an Atari. And with this move, I've taken away white's second eye. <laughs> so white took the two stones. And this is kind of a very human, reasonable move. As I was playing the game, I sort of had the feeling that um, after after the game, I would ask Katago about this move. And I was wondering if Katago was going to show me this variation where white captures on this side. When white plays here, if we look at the corner position uh, alone, if, you, if we just isolate that corner group that white has, it's completely dead because black can play here and here, and the white group is dead. But there's the problem that white can actually surround black on this side. And um, if black extends, uh, white can curl around and cover like this. Black, white can actually surround the black group, and it's going to be probably a seki or something. Um, black, black can make a knife, so black can get a seki at least. And so it's very painful to be playing this, this move here to make two eyes. Instead of, in the game, I, I got to play it uh, A9 instead. So... Having to just make two eyes like that is a bit painful for black. And the best black can hope for is a Seki. White's going to get huge influence on the outside. So this is going to be good for white. So actually, this uh, I would probably try to live on the side. Um, maybe something like this. This is probably what I would come up, come up with in the game. And then white can play here. Um, I'm going to look more into this in the game variation. It's very similar, only the fact that this white stone... In the game, it was capturing two stones, not putting black under so much pressure on the left side. So actually, this is a variation that I was sort of wondering if Katago would show it to me. And I was right. 
because Katago did like that better than the game move. Which, in, in the game, white captured two stones. This is a relatively safe-looking move, in which, at some point, white can throw in it uh, b19 and, and get a ko in the corner. So, for instance, after black lives, white can throw in here and get a ko. So white's not 100% dead yet. And there's a kind of a human tendency to, to try not to die. It's, it's pretty natural. But um, since white took the two stones instead of um, taking this point, it means I can I can live with the hane at a9, which is it's a big difference on the left side of the board. So I'm still in trouble though. So white pushes here. Um, and I covered. That was the best I could come up with. I think the computer was suggesting something like this. Um, with the idea that if white captures it, black gets a bit more momentum out into the center. Um, that move, uh, to be honest, I, I, it just did not occur to me. So I covered here. And played here. I'm trying to make two eyes. And here my opponent um, made a slight miscalculation. So if white had played here, then I would have cut here, and it would have been really complicated. Uh, but just to show you the main line here, it's going to be something like this with a fight on the upper side, but I can't actually kill those white stones. So maybe something like this. And I have to connect. Now I have to protect the cutting point on the outside. And white can make two eyes. Um, actually, um, just bear with me with the order of moves here, but this is this is how Katawa wants me to play it. And this is going to be a seki or a ko. And um, Katawa wants to play away with white now. I think any human player, even a professional, would want to play here, which would be a kind of a seki. If, if both players leave it, it's going to be a seki eventually. Um, but there is a ko here in the corner also. If white plays the ko, white will live... Um, and depending on whether black has a stone at f19 or not, it's gonna, there's the possibility that black will die, of course. So, uh, when both players leave it at this point, we don't really know whether it's gonna be that ko or gonna be a seki or whatever. So, if white plays away, I actually, I think, um, I think Kadawa wanted to start another fight here. But if black plays here, white's gonna be dead. But black's going to be dead also, and it's going to turn into something like a seki. Or if black plays on this side, it's going to be a ko in the corner. So it's going to be a seki or a ko. And white's alive everywhere else, and is probably taking the initiative on this on the right side here with this fight in the upper right corner. It's a, Yes, it is. I agree with the Don Slayer. It is uh, an exciting variation. And it's looking good for white, actually. Even though that white group in the corner is in danger, um, there's a lot of stuff happening on the outside that's probably more important. So let's see if I can find the game variation again. Uh, okay. I think I have to move for, further back. Okay, somewhere around here, yes. So uh, in the game, white actually played the hanging connection here. And this is going to be something actually that's, that's worth um looking at and like some of the variations uh i'll admit that they were a bit probably a bit complicated for some of the viewers but this is something that's actually pretty important what happens now this is going to be uh, a big eye versus a small eye and it's going to be a kind of a an unusual situation here where white is it looks like white might have a ko but it's actually going to be dead so i'll show you the game variation here where black plays here and is threatening to make two eyes at at f19. White's already dead, of course. So white continued with this exchange. White has two ko's attached to that group on the left in the corner. Uh, and there's a tendency to sort of assume that if white has all these ko's attached to that group, all white has to do is take away black's eyes. And white should have something here. You would assume that white has something here. That's It would be natural to assume that. First of all, if white wedges here, black already has two eyes with this move. So this would be alive. Or if white, um, yeah, or yeah, it's alive in either case, just to make sure. 
So in order to kill this black group, this would be alive too, if black plays here. So in order to kill the black group, white has to play here. And black is going to connect on the outside. And we'll get a shape something like this. So this is dead. Um, but it's a case of the big eye versus the small eye. So what happens with this is that, first of all, these two codes are going to cancel out. So we're going to assume both players are going to be fairly serious about filling liberties here. Um, if you ask a computer, it's just going to play away throughout the game. And it doesn't care whether it turns into a core or something. But um, being human, I'm going to be serious about filling liberties here. I'm going to say that when white takes that call, black did play away once. When white takes that call on the upper side, I'm going to say black's going to take the call on the left. So these two calls cancel out because white cannot win both of them at the same time. So we get to this position where white has filled all the outside liberties, but has a hopeless position inside. And just to define that, I'm going to play some more moves with white. And, well, let's answer that one. Black doesn't really need to. At this point, white cannot play an Atari at A19. But it is not a Seki, because black can. So um, at any point, black can play capturing the three stones. Since it was a big eye, black gets some extra liberties there. So black will be able to play this turn. Um, so actually, white filled too many liberties there on the inside. Um, but this is how a big eye versus a small eye. How This is a, a fairly basic example of how it works. At any point, black can capture the three stones. And it's important for black to wait to do that at the last moment. Because if black does that too early, then white will have the oppor opportunity to make it into a small eye. And then it would be a seki. So black is going to wait to the last moment to capture these three stones. Or in actual play, in Japanese rules, we would say that the white group is dead anyway. In fact, that's in actual play, that's how the Chinese rules work also. The white group would be called dead anyway, and the players would not be playing all these moves inside that black territory. But just to clarify, black will play this move at the last moment, and then we'll have some extra liberties, and the big eye will win. So that's, that's an example of how the big eye wins every time. And just going back here, even if white um, doesn't connect at A17, so let's see, uh, if white plays away somewhere like this, uh, black can play these moves inside the white territory, I mean inside the black territory, and again, um, in this case, it's going to be a ko locally. Uh, but the explanation is to say that um, theoretically, black can get rid of all of the ko threats throughout overall the board, throughout the board. And as black's final move, black can capture here and play here. And it's going to be a ko. But um, provided white doesn't have any quote, black gets to choose when to play this quote. So black can play it after all the quote threats have been eliminated and then can win. So theoretically, the Japanese just say that that's going to die. In the Chinese rules, um, if you wanted to, you could actually play it out without black losing any points. So the China, Chinese rules work that way also. And in almost all cases, unless you have a, uh, an unusual board position, it's going to work exactly the same way. So the, the rules generally tend to work the same way but the theory behind them is slightly different. So that was an example of a big eye versus a small eye. So at this point, the, the white group is already dead. And I think this was actually a miscalculation by mine. He sort of overlooked the fact that he could be dead with all those clothes attached to his group. Um, looking at the overall position, it's actually fairly... It's not a huge win for black. I, I'm back to... I probably have more than 50% winning percentage, if you ask a cutout. In fact, I think I know I do. But it's um, it's not a decisive game for human players. So white played away here. This is a really important move. And black's move in the lower right, lower left corner. This is a big move also. So this is the game variation. White actually is just... He has nothing to do in the upper left corner. He, there's nothing he can do about it. It's just dead. So that's a fairly big black territory. Uh, but white does have a lot of space that white can potentially control. So I think actually Katawa wanted white to continue playing towards the center. For instance, pushing here or 
or move like this, I think, where um, candidate moves. Um, but my opponent played here. Um, this move, it sort of, it's, it seems to work to me. I, I like this move because white is making the board, the open spaces, trying to take control of the open spaces on the board. And so white is trying to control a lot of area. And for instance, this lower side is a large area that is sort of controlled by white at this point. White has some potential towards the center of the board. Um, at this point, I would call this an undecided game. I think Kadova was giving me something close to 70%, which is, is it's not big enough for a human player to feel safe. And I played here. Um, so I'm going to invade the lower side. This is one way you can go about doing it. It's not my favorite move that I sometimes play, which is this one. In this case, um, it should be pretty obvious that all of the ladders are going to favor white. And so there's some variations that involve a ladder that I was a bit worried about. And I decided not to play this move. Interestingly enough, Karawa wants me to play here and, and th seems to think that black has a solid win. Um, and as I was saying just now, uh, it's not solid enough for a human professional. Okay. How big is F3 compared to O15? Um, it's probably not all that decisive, and it's good that you said or something. So that's N, N2 asking about Black's move here. Um, compared to this move, um, this move is pretty big because it uh, reduces white towards the center. There are some drawbacks in that white will have a forcing move here, which will force black to add another stone to that. So actually, I think that among the um, candidate moves, I think that Katago was suggesting pushing here, um, which is going to be another fight if white extends here. And it could be a bit complicated. So um, it's not a move that I would play when I was feeling that I just um, gained a lead in the board game. In the in the game, um, it's a it's a more it's the kind of move I would play when I thought I had to fight, continue to fight. Um, but it was one of the candidate moves. So um, when black plays here, there um, I this sort of squeezes black in the lower left corner. So it's probably it's probably bigger, um, but I would have trouble saying exactly how much. And but my my thought instead of playing here, I thought I wanted to invade the lower side. And here I, um, it's going to be relatively easy for me to settle this group on the lower side. So for instance, I could play something like this, and. I would have no problem living here, but that was not what I wanted to do. So I had this uh, great idea. <laughs> Again, um, just to forewarn you, what Kadago wanted me to play was to play here anyway. Just just leave the lower side. It's not going to die anyway. So that's what Kadago wants me to do. But I found this move, which is threatening to save that black stone. At this point, I felt it was not going to work if I tried to save that stone directly. It would just be a, a lot of trouble. So I didn't think that this was working. Um, there's actually an interesting variation where black jumps here. And white plays this move. And black lives in, on the side. Now white's going to be able to catch these black stones. And kind of a ladder here. And you might note that this, white really needed to play this exchange in order to make that possible. So there's this variation. Uh, when black cannot escape with good shape here and has to play the empty triangle, it's probably just going to be a bad fight for black. Okay, Q4. Satya Singh is asking, is Q4 a normal response compared to Q5? And they're both normal. Um, but if white answers, getting some great questions today. So um, if white answers... If white answers here, that's a good shape also. Um, black's going to try to play another forcing move by extending here. So this is actually going to be similar to some variations you get 
with the uh, um, attachment at the 4 4 point, the attachment of Q4. Only um, this this variation, it doesn't rely on the ladder. So in this case, black's going to be able to... Actually, black might immediately cut in the corner, but basically it's going to be something like this. Um, and black will continue pushing. So for instance, something like this is what black is going to be aiming at. And it's very similar to the Joseki where black has played an attachment at Q4, only this this time it's not going to depend on the ladder. There's no ladder involved. So I'd, I'd be feeling relatively safe in this variation. Um, but okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, so here, here we are in the game variation again. So yes, this this is a shape move, but um, if white connects in the corner, that that's giving black that many more stones in the area. And in this variation, it sort of reverts. I'll show you the variation I'm talking about that it reverts to is this one. And it's very similar. For instance, if white plays an Atari from this side, black is going to play this sequence, um, maybe extending once. And it's going to be a sequence ending up with the same shape. So it's very simply, very um, similar. Yes. The most natural way, exactly. Um, is, and I'm not going to be able to uh, pronounce that name. Moten Nut. Is that um, someone from Thailand, maybe? I can't pronounce the name. But yes, um, answering here is the most. Uh, the answering here is the most natural move. But there are also variations where white's going to answer from this side or from this side, that are a bit more complicated, and a bit more dangerous for black when white has all this influence in the upper left part of the board. And so these are the variations that I was, especially this one, which is, is really complicated and does involve a ladder to a certain extent. This was the variation that I was trying to avoid, actually. So back to the game. I played here. And I was sort of proud of this move. As I was showing you before, moving out with the one stone, uh, this stone immediately would have been an overplay. So I, I feel okay with sacrificing it, forcing white to put a stone in, and getting some extra momentum towards the center. Yeah. And um, a little peep here too. And lo and behold, this is a ladder breaking move. Oh, thank you. Apparently I managed to um, pronounce the name correctly. Um, I'm afraid to try again because I might mess it up next time. <laughs> and I played here. So I actually managed to play a ladder breaking move. Um, a multi-purpose move here. So Black's moving out towards the center and um, got um, and sacrificed that one black stone with a net, forcing White to put a stone in where White has so much thickness. I, th I thought it was okay if I could force White to put a stone in there. And I even got a ladder breaking move out of it. And uh, Karago didn't like any of this. It, it, it's just saying you're not supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. And so we get into this fight here. And locally, white's going to survive. If I play a move like this, uh, white's going to be able to cut here. And locally, white does have an advantage in this fight. So I need something just a little bit extra uh, in order to play that attachment, at M2. I need an extra stone in the vicinity. Uh, but I thought that maybe I could get away with just reducing the center in some cases. So I, I cut here just to see what white was going to do. And um, what White did do was this move, which is which actually worked fairly well for me. So this is a point where, um, yes, this is a point where Katago was saying that White should play the Atari, just sort of forgetting about White's potential in the center of the board, and should have focused on killing Black on the lower side. So that's how I inter uh, interpret the variation that Karago was showing me. And in this variation, I'm probably going to sacrifice those stones on the lower side and um, erase most of white's center 
It looks playable to me, but it's um, this would have been a better variation for what. In the game, White still wanted to have some of the center, so that that's more or less what this move is doing. White's stopping me from getting good position in the center. Uh, but in return for that, I got a really good position on the lower side. So starting with this move now, um, White has to crawl. I um, It's a bit vulgar. It's a bit um, too forceful, you might say, to be really looking good. But this is actually very useful in this board position where I need some more space on the lower side. And then I jumped. And you can see my stones are starting to get connected up. So it's that's that's the good thing for black. And I actually can cover here. And white is not completely alive here. But we're going to see how that works. I played this exchange. And uh, the important thing for me is that my group there is starting to look like it has a, a shape of some kind. So I'm, it's, it's coming together. And I covered here. Locally, white is not alive. But uh, white pushed through here and played a honey on the first line. So um, this move, actually, white is looking at a cut on the fourth line. The cut at 0, 4 If white plays a cut immediately, there's a number of ways I can kill that. But for instance, this way. I capture it in Geta. And white would get to... Actually, I would push through here. Um... And white would not get to connect underneath. Um, so, although white would live, it's going to be painful. So th this kind of variation would, would white would live on the side, but it would be a bit painful for white. So white started with the hane here and covered. And uh, if I continue um, trying to capture white here, I'm going to lose a liberty which means that white can cut here. Um, and this is going to be bad for black. If black plays here, um, I cannot connect this time because I've lost one liberty on the side. So I would lose that. I could play a ko, but I don't have any... I don't really have any good ko threats. And you might note that um, if we look at the upper left area of the board, um, with a dead group like that, white's going to have some ko threats. So for instance, b11 would be an obvious ko threat for white. White has some cool threats against the black group on the upper side, too. So playing a co here is definitely not a good idea. Not a good idea for black, that is. And so I pulled back here, and white connected them. That's okay for me. Um, and at this point, I am aware, actually, um, that I'm doing well. Black has made a little territory here in the center. Um, close to 10 points, not quite 10 points. Um, but black has made a territory, a, a living group, almost already. And this knight's move that I've just played is also starting to move into white's center. And so I have a slight advantage here. So the score that Kadabu gives you is usually pretty high in a position like this compared to the confidence that I have or actually the number of points I'm winning also. like It's a relatively close game, uh, although Kadabu thinks that black can easily win it. Didn't quite happen that way. Um, I played here. So this was um, this was a move that uh, sort of downgraded my position a little bit. Um, the best move was to play here. And this is really nice. Um, this works very nicely. I can see that this is the better move. So if white pushes here, black has a very nice connection in the center. If white pushes on the other side, black's going to have a nice connection to the side. So it's it's very easy for black to establish a connection here. And uh, that's what makes it a good move. That's the main reason at least. And so uh, maybe something like this was the suggested variation where black is breaking out into the center. So this would be a relatively easy win, I suppose. Um, in the game, we're still talking about just probably something like three and a half points or something like that. So it's Although it's relatively easy, it's not in the bag yet. So I played the knight's move here. And I, to break into the center, I have to play this attachment. So it's a bit more difficult. Um, and we got into this variation 
where I push through here. So I can save uh, the stones by playing, for instance, um, if white answers here, I'm going to play another forcing move in the center. Actually, I'm going to jump, I think. I, I'm probably going to jump. And white's group in the center is sufficiently weak that white probably has to answer fairly solidly here. And then I can escape in the center with, for instance, something like, I think I can actually get away with this move. And so this was uh, my idea here. And white played an Atari. I took this opportunity to push through here. And white sort of forced to capture the one stone. This variation was okay for me. And I felt a little bit relieved in that I had broken into the center. And at this point, I played a slack move. So at this point, it's really important for me to get back to the lower left corner as soon as possible. Because my lower left corner is it's still wide open. The 3-3 three, three point is wide open. And so I should probably um, immediately get back to it. Or I could play... Um, actually, Kato wanted me to play this exchange, which is threatening to push through at P13. White's probably going to play here. And then I can just protect the corner. So I can sacrifice some stones if white cuts at L12 or something like that. I can sacrifice those stones. And I'll be out into the center anyway. So that's not a problem. This would have been um, a win for black. Although it would have been pretty close. But in the game I played the Tari here. Now it gets really exciting when white jumps into the corner. And I didn't want to um, play the Ko here. So if I play here, white's going to play a hanging connection here. And I will not be able to kill this without a ko. So if I play a ko, there's going to be ko threats in the upper left. It's probably a dangerous variation for black to be playing. I don't think I like the looks of this. And I didn't like it in the game either. So I avoided the ko. Um, playing a bit passively here. But it's a very close game, and I was thinking it was... Probably not so bad. This move is going to create some potential towards the center of the board. And we're going to see it work very well in the actual game variation. So um, at this point, it's probably not very clear what I'm trying to do with this move towards the center. But there is something that's going to work there. So we'll, we'll just... I'll explain that as it happens. But it's because it is it did actually happen on the board. So that makes it relatively easy. And the game is sort of in the balance here. It's um, not a 100% uh, win for black yet, but uh, white's two moves surrounding the center were probably not the best. Um, I think the suggested variation from Katago was that white played here, and a variation like this, where white is getting a bit more territory on the right side of the board. This The right side here was pretty big, and in the game you're going to see me turning it into a, a black territory, although it's not so big um, to look at. It's probably in this game, it's more important than what is left of the center. The center is um, sort of interesting. The cent When you're surrounding the center, if you actually try to surround it, um, there's a lot of holes. So when white tries to surround the center, there's a lot of issues that white has to deal with. And black sort of um, chisels it down bit by bit. And it gets smaller and smaller. While black gets some extra points on the side. So in some cases like this, it's better to be taking the side territory. And white's going to get some points in the center of the board anyway. And so uh, this was the suggested move. Hmm. Oh, Derek Neal was late. Well, it's going to be on the YouTube channel also. Um, okay, back to the game. White played this move to surround the center. So it, um, surrounding the center like this, it's it's deceptive, or you might say it's hard to judge sometimes uh, whether it's actually a big move or not. In this case, uh, White should have taken the upper right corner. And uh, it looks like it's starting to be a, a good variation for black, but it's very, very close. This move is actually threatening in the center, uh, because if white plays away, if white plays here, this is, well, for instance, this would be a big territorial move. Um, black can push through here and cut here. So there's a double Atari there on the left, on the right, that what black has in reserve. 
so I can break out into the center. So white answered here. And so this is the test strategy that, um, it's one of the, the kind of move that I was looking at. So there's, it, it sort of depends on how white uh, tried to surround the center here. And when white played, um, played this stone and uh, played these moves surrounding the center, this turned out to be the weak point that was left behind. So this is the test strategy here. Um, I could make it into a, a problem, actually. It's, it's, I think it's worthwhile to make a problem out of this one, maybe. Um, black is going to combine the threat to connect to the right. For instance, if white plays on this side, black can connect to this side. And this would be getting into the white territory in the center. Or um, when white plays here, which was the game move, black can jump here. And if white pushes through, it's a it's a hanging connection. So this was the game variation, and I just connected here, threatening to wedge at uh, J J um, that's J eleven. Yeah. Um, I wanted to take Sente here in the center uh, because there's a big move elsewhere. Uh, there's a big move at O eighteen. That's a huge move, the biggest end game move. So my final um, destination is to play the Hane at uh, 018. Or it could have been the um, the move at P18 either. That, that upper right corner second line move is really big at this point in the game. Um, and, okay, I played this squeeze first. And I played this first. I think, oh yeah, well, this, this was apparently not the best move. But I do seem to have a very small... Advantage. Well, let's just leave that. And I played this big move. So that was the move that I wanted to play. It's big because the next um, N N19 is going to be an another forcing move. So um, this whole sequence here. And let's surround the black territory that's being increased. It's going to be these five points. So let let's use the triangle markers. So uh, we can count five points of black territory here. And if white played that move, if white had played that move, let's just have black play something like this. Then white uh, Q19 would have been white's move. So all, all of those five points that I just marked, these five points, um, they, they're not black's territory anymore. If we assume white plays that Hanesugi on the first line. And white's getting these five points. So... It's five points each, a ten point difference. And so commonly we would call that a ten point endgame. It's, uh, the difference between white playing it and black point playing it is a ten point difference. It's sort of tricky talk, talking about the size of endgame moves because there's various systems. Um, uh, but yeah. People who use a system calling it absolute value um, have a actually would call that a five point move. But um, that's that's a different story. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the game, um, but actually, at this, of course, we've been in overtime for a long, uh, most of the game, so um, it's understandable that White would play this move. This was probably the final losing move. Um, uh, and actually, Marcelo Carpenetti is asking a, a relevant question. At this stage, do you really count territory or use your intuition? Well, um, territories like this in the upper left, that's marked upper left. Territories like this, this this territory was, it was here from just about the beginning of the game. So um, in my mind, I've already sort of imagined a position where white has played here and I've played here to make two eyes. And I think it was 43 points or something. I actually don't remember what the calculation was, but I I had a correct calculation of the size of this territory. So that gave me a head start. So to a certain degree, in this particular game, I was actually counting the score. Uh, but I usually do not, if I'm in overtime, I usually just try to concentrate on the moves I'm playing. In the site, for instance, I just talked about the size of that move at 018. Um, the size, playing the biggest move is much more important than having a correct assessment of the situation. So sometimes I just uh, focus on the size of the move, playing the best move. 
and in the end game, that's something that you can calculate. And so it is more important than having a correct assessment of the situation because it's a usually a good policy to play the best moves, unless you're really desperate and you're trying to uh, confuse your opponent or something. Um, sometimes you do actually have to make a choice to play the most complicated move or to play the ko uh, to make a kind of a trade if you know that the, the correct move is actually going to be a loss. Um, but yeah, so it, it just sort of depends on the game, I guess. In this game, um, just the fact that I had already calculated the upper left corner and my territories are fairly well defined at this point. Uh, I had actually, um, I think I actually did have a calculation of the score. But it's not necessary, it, especially if you're in um, being putting under pressure with the time control. It's sometimes a good idea just to forget counting the territory. Now, it's so easy to make mistakes counting the territory anyway. Playing the good move is more important. So white played here. If white had played here, uh, pushed through instead, then white would have been able to get to this move, which is a pretty big point. And it's the final big point in the board. So this would have been closer than the game. I think maybe I would have won by half a point, but it would have been really close. In the game, white uh, pincered here, and, and and because of the ko, the capture for white stones, white has to answer this. So this is a ko that white doesn't really want to play. Um, at this stage of the game, I actually do have a good number of ko threats overall. So I have ko threats that are threatening to invade white's center territory, like this move. Um, I have ko threats threatening white's group on the right there. I have ko threats threatening white on the lower side here or here. So I have I actually have a lot of co threats and white's good co threats are, are still just mainly in the upper left area. So at this stage of the game white doesn't want to play the co. So white has to answer that. And I got to play this exchange. And then everything is about we equal. I, I chose to play this move which sort of settled the last question that people might have about that. Um, big eye, small eye situation that I was talking about earlier in the upper left. So now I'm completely alive there. And it was um, it was a Sente end game that was about three points for white, which makes it equal. Uh, it makes it equal to this move on the. This is also a three point move. That it, at this stage of the game, if I had played the honey at B1, it would have been a forcing move for black. So both of these are forcing moves that are worth three points with Sente. And so, for instance, if we go back two moves, I could have played this move, um, and it would have been a, a three-point for three-point trade. It would have been an even trade, so it would be no difference. So, yeah, just show you the game moves from here on. We finished the game. Oh, yeah, I think I have a uh, result somewhere here. Let's see if I can find it. Yes. So I ended up winning by one and a half points. So it was a very dangerous game for me throughout. And it was pretty close to the end before I actually was winning by one and a half points. So before that, uh, there was probably a period where it was only half a point. And of course, in the middle game, there were a lot of points where it was completely undecided. And in this game record, I'm leaving... Um, leaving these dame points unplayed because it looks it's sort of interesting it looks like black might have a, a move here but actually if black plays here white's well, just going to play here and when the liberties are filled uh, it's going to be bad for black because black will need to put a stone in this is this is going to be a collapse for black so um, this move here that seems to be a one point move is actually it's, it's not worth anything so that's it for today that's my game um okay some questions uh patrick is asking do i think my opponents in the tournament would benefit from watching my channel or would it not tell them anything they didn't already know um you know maybe maybe some players would benefit from that but i think the players that i really have to worry about 
um, already know those variations in the upper left corner. So um, probably the bottom line is that I don't have to worry about them watching my channel. <laughs> and the stuff that I talked about in the upper left corner, um, anyone can get the, the, um, the basic variations. Um, you have to research them. And there's, there's a lot that I didn't go into, uh, thousands of variations. And, you know, it, it would just uh, blow your mind. It, it's too much for me anyway. And so it's um, th that very, that Joseki variant in the upper left corner is something that's very tough for professionals to, to understand completely. And they'll probably learn more about it if they study it without even watching my channel. They, they're studying it on their own. Okay, Derek Neal was asking, what's the next steps after winning this? And that's a good question. I This is the final of the qualifying tournament. So uh, that finished me for a while. And I think they're on the, on the TV station, they're probably still doing games from the previous tournament. So the 30th tournament. I think this is the 31st USA Cup. And they're still doing some games from the 30th. So they're not quite finished with the previous tournament. In a few months, maybe they'll um, they'll get a they'll um, they'll get a point from me. And actually, since I'm a nine don in that particular tournament, I'll be um, starting fairly late into the tournament, and I'll have tough opponents to start. So I'll have someone who's won a lot of games from below, a lower ranked player who's won a lot of games in that. Tournament. Obviously, that's going to be formidable. And then if I beat that person, I'll be playing. Um, Probably a title holder, some someone close to uh, a more senior nine dun than myself. And if I if I do very well and I win all my games, um, in that section of the tournament, there is a final section which is going to be a, a knockout, uh, elimination tournament um, among the top eight players, or something like that. Maybe it's more players now. So thank everyone for watching. Uh, I should I should uh, push my Patreon. I keep forgetting to do that. I do have a Patreon page where people can support me, and you can get um, you can get teaching games in the fifty dollar um, tier of Patreon. Um, yeah, it's a it's a um, streaming star. Um, Sathya Singh is asking, um, my happy there seeds. It's actually sort of seeds, but since that tournament uh, promotes player, it promotes two players from each group to the final section, and so the player who is starting at a low sec, starting from the beginning of the tournament, um, has more opportunities, I think, to to get a number of wins in, and that uh, so he, uh, a player at the beginning of the tournament could get some wins and promote to the next stage of the tournament with enough wins. Whereas at my stage, I'm pretty close to the end of that. And so even if I win all my games, it could probably be just two or three wins and it would not be enough to promote to the final tournament. So I would have to win all the way to the end. So basically that means I have to beat some very big names, uh, a couple of big names at least to get into the final tournament. But it's, in, it's exciting to be able to play these people. Marcelo Carpinetti. Am I, oh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, too. Um, um, next commentary on older games. Could I uh, do a Takaga Shukaku? Yeah. Um, I'll look into it. He's he's one of the players on the list, definitely. So, okay. So um, I'm ending here. Uh, thanks every, to everyone for watching. Um, I'll continue to do lives. I don't really have a schedule yet, but um, probably on this day of the week, um, once or twice a month. So that's that's my plan at this point. So thank you everyone for watching. Goodbye.